Tonight, President-elect Donald Trump on the offensive just days before taking office. But are the latest Twitter battles helping his cause or hurting him politically? The party panel is here. Plus, if the Clinton Foundation is such a force for good in the world, then why are the Clintons shutting down one of its most important charities? Huh? And will President Obama crank up the surveillance state just before he leaves office? Tonight, Buck Sexton on the new evidence of more government snooping. Grab a snorkel. It's time to dive in. This week, the president-elect becomes president, and it's Donald versus Goliath as the incoming commander takes on three institutions at once, the press, the intelligence community, and the embodiment of the civil rights movement, Georgia Representative John Lewis. After last week's press conference that was more explosive than a dozen bowls of colon blow, nail-biting journalists are worried their mercurial charge will shut down access to outlets he hates. Trump Chief of Staff Reince Priebus fanned the flames when he responded to media eviction rumors. The only thing that's been discussed is whether or not the initial press conferences are going to be in that small press room. Oh, yeah, reporters like to wander in and out of the White House offices like Luigi and Super Mario Brothers, haggling for gossip and scoops. It's protocol. It's tradition. It's kind of annoying. But how long can the incoming administration ask these adolescent existential questions? But why do we even have a press, man, before the horde turns on them completely? Well, why don't we ask outgoing know-it-all John Brennan, the CIA head who's out of a job but right in the middle of a political hot pot, engaging the president-elect on intelligence in Russia. And irked, Mr. Trump tweeted in disgust about the suspect Russian dossier detailing his hooker-fueled pee parties, saying, quote, intelligence agencies should never have allowed this fake news to leak into the public. One last shot at me. Are we living in Nazi Germany? He said leak. This didn't sit well with Brennan, who responded. What I do find outrageous is uh, equating an intelligence community with Nazi Germany. I do take great umbrage at that, and there is no basis for uh, Mr. Trump to point fingers at the intelligence community for leaking information that was already available publicly. But no one likes that. It is a little strange, though, that when the dust-up started, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer warned POTUS about nasty intel retribution. You take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Huh. So Schumer knows the secretive intel apparatus can be used as a punitive political tool? Unacceptable. Now, of course, the Donald wasn't done and reacted coarsely after civil rights leader, Georgia Representative John Lewis, said this about his presidency. I don't see this president-elect as a legitimate president. And Mr. Trump tweeted this, Congressman John Lewis should spend more time fixing and helping his district, which is in horrible shape and falling apart, not to mention crime infested, rather than falsely complaining about the election results. Sad. Lewis and 28 other Democrats are now boycotting the inauguration, just as many did for the swearing in of our 43rd president back in 2001, including Lewis. So you people are representatives. Now go represent your constituents and stop throwing a fit because you got the wrong flavor jello. Looks like Goliath is going to be a giant pain in your keister. You ready to rock? Good. I'm Kennedy. Donald Trump is floating the idea that CIA Director John Brennan leaked damaging material about him to Russia or about Russia on him. So are we in for an intelligence community versus Trump showdown? Let's bring in tonight's fireproof party panel. They are so hot, including Nomiki Konst, Democratic strategist and political reporter for the Young Turks. Gavin McInnes is also here of the Gavin McInnes Show. He's also a Talkie Mag contributor. And Matt Welch, Reason Magazine editor at large. There you are saying hi to everyone, especially you. All right, hi, friends. <laughs> hi. Hello. So uh, let's kick this pinata a little bit. Um, so you've got a big problem here because uh, apparently you've got the intelligence community, whatever that's supposed to mean, whatever that's supposed to encompass, uh, whichever actors are under that umbrella, uh, angry and in an active feud with the incoming president. How problematic is this? 
think it's especially prog problematic for Donald Trump because any good president knows that they need the intelligence community so they can get intelligence on other countries to set up proxy wars. Yeah. So any good dictator <laughs> would know, don't, don't piss them off. He needs yeah. this information. But really, it's a problem. I mean, he's not taking this seriously. I, I, I don't know where it goes from here because yeah. there's really no checks on Donald Trump. Uh, it doesn't mean he's just dis dismantling our government step by step. I, I really don't I, know. I, I think there are more checks on the president than there are on the CIA, certainly. Absolutely. And this is, I mean. Which makes it the whole thing kind of weird. Kind of weird and kind of fascinating. I mean, there's so much weird news, some of which you uh, referenced at the top of the show here going on, that we're not really fully absorbed in the fact that the president, incoming president, is in open warfare with the head of the CIA. Yeah. That just has never <laughs> happened. This, the whole CIA and intelligence community has operated without oversight essentially since World War II. Yeah. And they've just metastasized since then like crazy. We don't know what their budget is. I mean, we, we don't have any sense of what is restraining them. And so you have a president-elect who is taking them on by <laughs> calling them Nazis yeah. on day one. We are going to find out, if we, if we haven't found out already, whether there is such a thing as a deep state. Yeah. Are, there, are there actors who are like really in charge of things? We're going to find that out. It's yeah. Are, are we going to bring the conspiracy theories to the surface and finally see what the government is really made of? I think it's interesting because I think, you know, the understanding for every other president who's ever ascended to the office has been, all right, these guys really run stuff, and they're just going to tell me what to do as a figurehead, yeah. and I don't think Donald Trump really accepts that format. Can you imagine Russia being like this? Can you imagine Putin being in, in, uh, in a fight with the KGB? It's, it's unimaginable. And I think that he is, liberals, he is KGB. Yeah. liberals need to imagine that Obama... It'd be like Obama, if Mike Baker were president. <laughs> <laughs> liberals need to imagine Obama did it. Once they do that, they can see the merit with moves like this. He's saying, I'm not beholden to a company that they don't even know what they're doing. There's so much clandestine secrecy with the CIA mm -hmm. that half of them think the other guy is a spy. Yeah. I don't trust them. I don't think they trust themselves. I've mm -hmm. seen Mr. and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> I know oh, how yeah. these things end on private planes when you're yelling at your 17 children on your way Gorgeous to the divorce fights. Lawyer. That's yeah. what the CIA <laughs> is. Yeah. Sexy fights. That's, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Wow, talk about hot pots of coffee. Donald Trump's honeymoon with the press lasted just three seconds, and it's going to get so much worse. The president-elect hinting that he might boot reporters out of the West Wing. Brian Priebus says if the press corps gets evicted from the White House, it will only be to find a larger space to accommodate even more media. But critics say they worry that Trump will oust reporters in order to better control what the public hears and about his administration. Uh, so, Nomi, I will start with you. This is not unique to mm -hmm. an administration. It's just happening sooner than it usually does. And presidents usually, like, grit their teeth and smile through it, like, I love the press. These guys are great. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, President Obama was awful with the press. Uh, Hillary Clinton actively despised them and refused to have a press conference for over 200 days. Mm -hmm. So is this really that surprising? It's not surprising. I think what's surprising is the tone in which uh, Donald Trump is so aggressive that he's feuding with them openly. He's calling CNN and BuzzFeed fake news at press conferences. But I think the press should fight back. You know, the grabs back. I think wow. the press needs to grab back. Oh my they should set up separate press conferences, invite every enemy of Donald Trump to show up every <laughs> single day in front of the White House until he does press conferences. Oh, he'll do press conferences. He loves the press. He needs the press. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people were really upset that he shut down Jim Acosta from CNN because yeah. members of the traditional media feel like it's not the president's job to pick and choose uh, the nice people who ask him acceptable questions. I feel like Obama has always done that. And well, then he filibusters and gives a six-minute answer to one that would really require 20 seconds. Yeah, and you'll notice, by the way, if you see the press corps, you see that Jake Tapper and Chuck Todd are in the front row. CNN are in the front row in that room, mm -hmm. and they like that's what this beef is really about. He never said he's not going to have press conferences. He said it's no longer about the aristocrats in the front row. I'm bringing in bloggers. I'm bringing in talk show guys. And no one really knows this who hasn't been there. The White House sucks. <laughs> it was it, since it's Canadians old. burnt Yuck. it down in 1820. <laughs> <laughs> Every room is tiny and rickety. That room fits 49 people. All he said was, I'm going to move it to a bigger room. Uh, again, pretend Obama did it. Yeah. Obama expands room for press, allows for more people to get more information. Yeah, but he had, you know, three dozen press organizations file a claim against his administration because the Obama administration wasn't exactly being transparent. I mean, that's right. James, anybody with a name like James or Risen or Rosen, they just hate Obama.
Obama's uh, record. He went in as the most transparent administration in history and just absolutely wasn't. He's been terrible about this. So yeah. some of this hyperventilating makes you want to say, okay, I'm glad you showed up for work eight years later yeah. uh, here. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I think uh, Trump's going to win every public fight, uh, yeah. public relations fight. If it's all about like access to the White House press room, nobody cares. Voters certainly don't. They want reporters to take it in the rear end. But ultimately, and they also want reporters who look, talk, and speak like them surveying the landscape. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, with we that. got his tweets. We can talk to him anytime <laughs> yeah. we want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, gonna have. I, I love Twitter. I love that he's on Twitter. I love that it's unmediated, but it can't be the only source because no. that can also be a tool of propaganda. Right. Well, what's, what are they, what are they going to do now? They're going to go. All these bureaucracies, the deep state and the non-deep state, yep. are going to go and try to stop whatever Trump is doing because they're appalled by his actions. No. Oh, and so they're going he's to be such going, a rube. They're going to he's be going into Eddie. every single reporter's house. <laughs> this is going to be the uh, the biggest uh, kind of anti-administration uh, press corps we've seen since Richard Nixon. Well, fans of chaos have yet to be disappointed. Well, thank you very much. We're going to see the part of panel a little later in the show. In the meantime, President Obama last night gave yet another <laughs> long-winded farewell interview. This time it was 60 minutes or 600 minutes, it felt like. He had a lot to say about how great he thinks his presidency was. But he also chatted about how partisanship is poisoning Washington. So what should we do about Israel? He even had a warning for his successor. The one thing I've said to him directly, and I, I would advise uh, my Republican friends in Congress and supporters around the country, is just make sure that as we go forward, certain norms, certain institutional traditions uh, don't get eroded because there's a reason they're in place. He also said that nobody should underestimate Donald Trump and that he must repair his relationships with the intelligence community stat. Well, guess who's here and who's very intelligent? It's Brian Kilmeade, host of Fox and Friends. He's also got a nationally syndicated radio show that is award-winning and alluring. And has you on, which is smart. Quite frequently, which I absolutely adore. Every Thank moment you. of it with you, Brian Kilmeade, what did you make of the president's interview on? Number Saturday? one, he's extremely composed. He's so much cooler than I'll ever be. And he has his great family. And I, I appreciate the fact that he does say very pro-American things after eight years. I'm being totally uh, sincere in that. However, he's just got a different take of his legacy and yeah. I think ultimately we're going to get a chance to give a legitimate look at it because for the most part 80% of the media has been on his side sure. even if you read today's uh, New York Times it says reading has been great for Obama he's a voracious reader give him a balance do you know George Bush read like a, di oh, a different a book a week along with Paul Rove yeah. you would have no idea and they wouldn't salute him for reading yeah. that's uh, that's like that's what you do for third graders Even though when they read the, on their the own first lady Laura Bush uh, president 43's esteemed wife yes that was her her call celebrity. she was pro reading as yeah. you are pro reading big fan and I pro I like to read to you but that's I a whole other segment story. yes you do right uh, but but on on this in particular I the fact that you don't, don't underestimate uh, Donald Trump, I think, is interesting. The fact that he should repair his relationship with the intelligence community is an interesting thing. That might be a positive. However, do you remember how he started his administration? Maybe it was uh, maybe it was. Yeah, Eric all he did was badmouth George W. Bush for six years. Enhanced interrogation. Yeah. We might bring these guys to justice. These people that did, and these women that did this, really, that ultimately produced Bin Laden, his location, that ultimately produced information from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, Hambali, and all these others. You love waterboarding. I, well, I'm pro enhanced interrogation to get what we want to keep Americans safe. Yeah, but even the oatmeal. Uh, I mean, there was stuff in there. There was so. Right. I think oatmeal without uh, some type of cinnamon is, yeah. should be torture. You can't taste right. it the way they were feeding it to uh, yeah. some of these detainees, right. though. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure what you mean by taste. Yeah, I'll show you but, later. But I would just I would just say this: enhanced interrogation led to the information that kept us safe, and he thought he'd take on that right away. And I thought, wait a second, you're in the middle of a war on terror, and you're looking to take down the CIA slash FBI slash uh, uh, national. So, but now record. he's telling Donald Trump that he repair. has to repair his relationship with the intel community, right? When he was equally critical of them early in his presidency. Unless his attorney general was going rogue without telling him, because I don't know if he had cable at his office, because yeah. he says he didn't like cable television because we actually covered that so I just thought it was interesting one thing I also give uh, President Obama credit for he has not gone out of, he's gone out of his way not to criticize Donald Trump directly unless he's pulling the strings behind the scenes which could be happening I'm not sure for the most part he legitimate, uh, legitimately you mean elected since the election since the election because before the election he worse. was very very vocal with his criticism that was, that's relatively yeah. that's uh, very Didn't diplomatic do him any good. of you right. yeah.
Trump, but he said this guy's a joke. It's not that he apprentice. Yeah. Blah blah blah. And then, and then he made the president. joke on uh, on Jimmy Kimmel about well, at least. I will have been president. Right. <laughs> Turns out he's wrong. In 2011, when he got the ultimate laugh, he thought he had the final laugh. Yeah. What he did is he laid the trap and, uh, and set the tone for president, now president-elect Trump to become President Trump because he ticked him off to the degree where he was going to use all his attributes to become president. And even though Next Congressman know, Lewis doesn't agree, the he's legitimately the president. Yes. Well, Brian Kelly, thanks again. Thank you very much. Very good. All right, coming up, Donald Trump wants to replace Obama's insurance for everybody policy with a new policy that gives insurance to everybody. What? Charles Payne's going to sort it all out. And a little later, Bill and Hillary Clinton shutting down a wing of their foundation. Huh, almost like it's not as important since Hillary lost the election. How weird. Party panel returns to discuss. Stay with me. President-elect Donald Trump reportedly putting the finishing touches on his plan to replace Obamacare, but it appears he's taken a page right out of the Democrats' playbook. Despite saying Obamacare has been a complete and utter failure, in an interview with the Washington Post, Trump said, quote, we're going to have insurance for everybody. There was a philosophy in some circles that if you can't pay for it, you don't get it. That's not going to happen with us. So this differs from Obamacare how? Here now, it's Charles Payne, host of Making Money with Charles Payne, right here on the Fox Business Network. Catch it weeknights at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 in the West. So insurance for everybody sure sounds a lot like single-payer insurance. Yeah, you know, I, they told me this. I had two choices of topics, this or doing a Rubik's Cube uh, blindfolded. So I said, <laughs> <laughs> let me try this one. I think another thing that uh, President-elect Donald Trump said was that he doesn't care about the stock prices of drug companies. Yeah. So maybe we're going there. Maybe we're going to a place where, hey, uh, we're going to have some form of solution for this that um, it's going to cap, control, push, edge, nudge, browbeat uh, yep. the private sector into making less money. Yeah, and that's, that's <clears throat> not good ultimately, not only for people who work for those drug companies, but as Brian Brenberg pointed out last week, it's bad for research. And, you know, if, if you don't have every institution, every organization that is subjected to the right. whims of the free market, then you've got some sort of government force and coercion, and this president-elect has said that he's going to negotiate with drug manufacturers that supply drugs to Medicaid and Medicare, right. which and, is pretty and, much every and, drug manufacturer. <laughs> and that, by the way, has not happened in the past because of Republicans. In fact, Tom Price voted against yeah. uh, such, such a thought. Um, you know, I think the president, uh, would be President Trump, has, has a, to a degree of fiduciary responsibility for ta with taxpayer money. Yeah. So in that role, I see where he's coming from. There's a free market uh, role, and there's also the notion that you bring up, the realistic, honest-to-God notion of, hey, if drug companies can't make money off of drugs, then they won't create these drugs in the first place. Yeah. And, 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 there, and it's, there's got to be an elegant solution. I don't know what they are. I mean, I, don't, I wish I knew what all the pieces of this puzzle were, the solution and I can't is wait to hear it. never more government. Well, the we know solution that. is always less that. government. It's, right. it's scale back the FDA. But, you know, what worries me is why do we have to pay for everybody to have insurance? I understand that the poorest people, the oldest people, the sickest people who cannot make money, there is a big difference between them and everybody else. Right. But, uh, you know, it, it's always a bigger group of people who have more advocacy, and they're the ones who get the insurance first, and these people get left in the cold, and you never even fix the problem in the first place. Well, that's part of the problem, you know. I tell Medicare's going to become a crap sandwich, Charles. <laughs> Some would say it already is, yeah, though. But, oh, so you know, good. here's the thing. Uh, when, when Obamacare initially went through, I hadn't even, I had n never heard the uh, President uh, the Obama talk about uh, helping people 400% over poverty, for instance. In yeah. other words, this was lurching all the way towards some sort of single-payer solution. Donald yeah. Trump says it won't be under him. So it's going to be intriguing to see how this works out. And, and again, uh, you know, some of the high-profile things we've seen in the news lately from the EpiPen to Martin Screlly, I think those are unique situations where you had drug companies that were desperate for profits take orphan drugs and jack up the price. Yeah, I think there run should, by narcissists. Right. Those, there should be legislation against usury. Yeah. Uh, which those those cross the line, but if a drug company is developing a drug, they go through five phases of FDA approval. Mm -hmm. They spend two billion dollars. They need some sort of return on investment. 
or cut down the amount of time and the amount that? of red tape that? to yeah. get you know good drugs to market uh, to fix sick people. Right. There's no doubt that that needs to be adjusted. There's no doubt whatsoever. When you and I are emperor and empress of the universe, <laughs> respectively, everything will be perfect. I can't wait. When's our turn coming? About 16 years? <laughs> yeah, exactly like right, Charles. <laughs> 2020 vision, four years from now. We both got it. Charles, yeah. thank you so much. See you later. Love it. All right. Coming up, Donald Trump is rankling a big, powerful country. And believe it or not, it's not Russia. So who is in Trump's crosshairs? Ambassador John Bolton talks to me about the president-elect's foreign policy challenges. That's next. Welcome back. If President-elect Donald Trump wants a fight with China, it appears he may very well get it. In an interview with our corporate cousins at the Wall Street Journal, the president-elect said that everything is negotiable with China, even its policy, toward the breakaway island of Taiwan. Well, the Chinese government apparently wasn't too thrilled about that, warning Trump that Taiwan is not negotiable. And two of their state-run newspapers today each published editorials calling Trump, quote, a rookie and warning him that he is, quote, playing with fire. The question now, are our ties with Taiwan worth the economic fallout of a fight with China? Or should Trump stand up to the Chinese government? Joining me now, it's John Bolton, former ambassador to the UN and a Fox News contributor. Welcome back, Ambassador. Glad to be with you. So let's talk about this one China policy. That's all anyone keeps talking about, the one China policy. And what I want to know is who set the policy and was it those communist bullies? Well, it's, uh, there's a lot of dispute about what the one China policy is. And, and this is a favorite Chinese bargaining tactic. They create a slogan, kind of benign sounding. Uh, they get the unwary foreigner to agree to it, and then they reinterpret it. Ow. One China means one thing to the people in Beijing. It has always meant something else to the United States. What does and it mean to us? Uh, it means that ultimately we acknowledge that in the Shanghai communique of 1972 that all Chinese on both sides of the Taiwan Strait believe there is only one China and Taiwan is a part of it. The United mm -hmm. States acknowledges it and takes note of it. We didn't yeah. agree to it and we particularly didn't agree that one China means Beijing controls. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what China has said in one of these editorials uh, that I referenced. They wrote in China Daily, if Trump is determined to use this gambit on taking office, a period of fierce damaging interactions will be unavoidable, unavoidable as Beijing will have no choice but to take off the gloves. What does it mean for China to take off the gloves? Well, as opposed to what they're doing now in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, I understand at many levels of our government and in the top circles of American corporate life, people would listen to those words and say, okay, time for the United States to surrender because mm -hmm. obviously we can't stand up to the Chinese. The fact is every time they try this bluster and intimidation and we back down, they win at no cost to them. Frankly, I would make uh, Taiwan an element in the overall relationship. I would be willing to change the 1972 Shanghai communique because if we don't put our issues on the table with uh, China, if in effect here we don't play the Taiwan card, uh, their bargaining leverage simply increases to our detriment. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, there, there's been obviously a lot of ch talk about Russia and China, and you have some mixed points of view uh, within the Trump administration. And we saw that particularly with Secretary of State nominee Rex Tillerson. What do you think is, is more dangerous and problematic for the U.S., Russia or China right now as both nations stand? Well, I think right now you'd have to say Russia because of its uh, uh, efforts to increase its influence in the Middle East at our expense and the pressure it's putting on Eastern and Central Europe, the fact that it has a much more extensive and well-developed uh, nuclear capability, its uh, missile forces, its uh, uh, capability to hit the United States. But obviously China is a much bigger country and the relationship between, uh, between China and the United States uh, is the biggest issue this century for the United States states internationally. All right. And uh, obviously our economies are inextricably linked and uh, that's a huge factor. Do you ever see a hot war with China? Well, we certainly hope not. Nobody wants that. The question is whether they understand there are limits to what they can do. 
because if you simply believe that intertwined economies means they win, then, then that outcome is not to our advantage. They have as much at stake economically as we do, but when they uh, make territorial claims in the South China Sea, when they create islands on which they build military bases, when they declare uh, an air defense identification zone in the East China Sea, when they seize equipment going from Singapore to Taiwan, when they uh, engage in mercantilist policies mm. in violation of their own international commitments, somebody needs to stand up to them. The United States hasn't done that for eight years. Yeah. Well, I know two things. There are always limits, and there is always another Jennifer Aniston rom-com on the horizon. Ambassador Bolton, thank you so much. If you say so. Indeed. <laughs> All right, coming up, there was a time when college kids protested when they felt threatened by politicians. So what are our precious snowflakes planning to do on Inauguration Day? Retreat to their safe spaces, of course. No microaggressions, please. Good Lord. Coming up next. Welcome back. Are you terrified of the upcoming inauguration? Do you need a safe space to hide away from an event that's going to happen whether you watch it or not? Yeah. Well, there's real good news for you. Universities across the country, because some will reportedly be holding alternate events this week to distract from the inauguration of one Donald Trump on Friday. One such event is the People's Inauguration. Is that happening in Beijing? Sure sounds like it. No, <laughs> it's at the University of Connecticut where students can share poems, songs, and personal stories. Here to discuss what poems they've picked out, it's the party panel, no Mickey Konst, Gavin McGinnis, and Matt Welch. Gavin, uh, what would you rather be doing than listening to UConn students sing songs and read poems about how much they dislike Donald Trump? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if you've ever worn razor wire as a wig, but uh, <laughs> your, your threshold of pain never oh, stops. It keeps getting more and more painful as the gravity gets in and the cuts get infected. <laughs> so I would say a razor wire afro would be uh, at the top of my list for that, yeah. <laughs> It sounds uh, super sexy. <laughs> well, Nomiki might have a different approach because she says there really are people who have something to worry about with this incoming administration. Including Republicans yeah. who fear that their party has been taken over by this orange, you know, Putin uh, figure. No, I, I think that a lot of people are scared, yeah, especially undocumented people. I hate to take a serious tone here, but the truth is, is the promises that you Donald Trump scared. has made, they would think they're going to ship them back to their birth countries where they've been here their entire Illegal lives. Illegal aliens are scared? Good. That's the plan. So if you came here at six months old, don't speak Spanish, don't know what it's like in Guatemala. I go, hey, parents, why'd you commit a crime and put me in jeopardy? What have you or, done, you or why, did they, why did they flee poverty and flee These poor drug dealers' kids, issues. when these drug dealers get arrested, their children have nowhere to go. It's so mean to follow the law. The three drug dealers and 60 million people that could possibly be at risk of, of Oh, good, so you admit there's 60 million illegals here. It could be. I don't know. Finally, some up rational here. figures I think from the, the number lab. is somewhere around like 8 million, but... Okay. Well, Matt, I yeah. would like you to uh, break the tie because yeah. Gavin and Nomiki <clears throat> cannot agree on this issue and, and you work for reason. I wish that any of them would actually mix it with a history lecture, yeah. which isn't just a bunch of people emoting about their feels Stuff uh, about what's happening right on. now yeah. and what do we think about politics right now. It's like, okay, um, do we have a history department here? Who does this person remind us of? Is he like... Papio Daniel, a guy who ran for governor of Texas in the 1940s. What was he like back in the day? And this kind of stuff. What I just was made Pappy that up. Like? He was a uh, he was a radio broadcaster and an, a serial entrepreneur. Did who, he make moonshine? Uh, he might have made moonshine. No, seriously, it's, uh, <laughs> Jesse Walker wrote a great piece uh, for Reason about this. Uh, oh, I love Jesse there are Walker. there are characters in American history who are like this. So let's talk about that. But it's not going to be that. It's going to be an emo emotive fest. And I guess that's what the colleges are for. Too much emotion, not enough reason. I said it. Hillary Clinton <laughs> insisted throughout her campaign that the Clinton Foundation is a charity and in no way connected to wheeling and dealing political favors. Critics said the foundation was a legal way for high rollers to buy influence with then Secretary of State and possible future presidents. Well, president, rather. Well, the foundation is shutting down one wing of itself, the Clinton Global Initiative, because donations have plummeted in the wake of Hillary's defeat. Almost like the donors 
have quit caring now that their money only provides access to a grandma who likes to hike in the woods of Rhode Island. Uh, Gavin, I will start with you. Isn't this just proof the whole thing was pay for play the entire time? Yeah, well, what's the matter with that? I, I donated to the Wounded Warrior Project under the impression that they would stop the war or win it. And then I talk to a lot of these vets and I go, uh, what's going on? There's still a war over there. And I stopped donating right away because I was donating for political favors. Oh, yeah. And you, you weren't able to create any. If the vets are not going to make changes with that money, then they don't deserve the money. Well, I don't know that that's That's the way charity works. Wounded Warrior Project. But that's exactly what they were doing, Nomi. I mean, they were, they were selling yeah. favors, and the only political trip they had was her future presidency, yeah. which didn't materialize, and now the foundation is no good. I totally agree with you on this, and I'll get to that in a second. But the reality is, is they were going to shut down the initiative well before she, assuming that she would win the presidency. And all but those now people that she's can not, move, why shut it wait, down? Wait, There's no conflict of interest. But this is the catch. They were going to shut it down because all those people thought they were going to go work for the administration. Yeah. And now it's already been shut down. It was already in the works. They got to shut it down. The reality is, is that. They, they, well, there was some good work, it wasn't enough good work, and they kept calling it incrementalism, but it was just institutionalism. Mm. No good work happens when you become a bloated, uh, bloated institution that just fundraises so you can pass right. out patronage jobs. That's like me busking outside of five guys. <laughs> bloated, begging for money, <laughs> worthless, and a, a failure. You said 4.30 today, right? This is like the, the Clintons are perfect at legalized uh, grossness, and yeah. this is a perfect example of that of like this yeah. is the genteel way of being corrupt. corrupt everybody knows what's going on here you got a rolling davos and and then you can just <laughs> have the money yourself and any like any you know leader of uh, turk crap oh, you over <laughs> Rolling Davos is so appropriate and it's so bougie yeah. and it just it, it makes you pucker in all the wrong places. Party panel, thank you so much. Thank Matt, you. Gavin, <laughs> Nomi, a great night. Hopefully you had fun too. Coming up, the Obama administration is beefing up the NSA, just giving it surveillance roids right before Donald Trump takes office. Former CIA agent Buck Sexton joins me to tell us what we need to know about our privacy. What privacy exactly? The Obama administration just injected some new steroids into U.S. intelligence agencies, granting departments new access to raw surveillance data gathered by the NSA. Now, in the past, the NSA used to filter out private information before farming the data out to other departments. But now, a whole lot more federal eyeballs will have access to our private information. Yay, Liberty. Uh, Buck Sexton is here, host of the Buck Sexton Show on the Blaze. He's also a former CIA officer. Uh, welcome back. This scares me. I also like being introduced with yay liberty, but usually with more enthusiasm, by the way. <laughs> you are a champion worse. of liberty. Yeah, I am a you, champion you, of liberty. You've Absolutely. seen the apparatus. You've, you've felt the tentacles of the beast from I, the inside out. I used to read these NSA reports they're talking about. Yeah. This is concerning the moment that it crosses over into the law enforcement side of things, I think, for most Americans. Yeah. There are the libertarians among us who recognize this, this whole NSA surveillance dragnet as really just the 21st century uh, general warrant. If we're going to go all the way back to the founding, this idea that you can get all this information and then use algorithms and it's still okay. That's even a little separate, or I shouldn't say separate, but this is a more specific part of that discussion with the sharing of raw collection from yeah. technical sources, technical collection, uh, with what could be law enforcement agencies that then may engage in parallel construction, meaning that once you know who the guy is who's bringing the huge bales of marijuana into the country, even if you don't use that information to prosecute him, it's a lot easier to figure out, okay, this is the person that we need to find. Well, if he's been you communicating with, with people in this country who haven't necessarily committed crimes, then all of a sudden all of their information is now available to a multitude of other agencies. And it's not necessarily new surveillance. That's how they're shielding themselves. They're not doing any new spying. They're just taking a lot more information and sharing it with a lot more people, which can be very, very problematic. Right. And, and again, when that information sharing makes its way into the hands of people that can criminally prosecute you, 
you. I mean, this is the huge distinction. It also brings up the Snowden discussion. Yeah. Where I know a lot of people say Snowden's a hero, and then I always have to point out, well, a lot of the stuff you shared about what happens overseas has nothing to do with constitutional issues, has nothing to do with transparency. Yeah. That was just an enormous act of treason. You can put that aside for now, but when you look at what the U.S. is doing and this new sharing of information, the fact that FBI eyes will be on this stuff, yeah. the notion of a Chinese wall between the guys in the FBI who are just collecting intelligence and those who are trying to create cases for criminal prosecution, that should concern a lot of Americans because even if we are getting criminals by sharing more information, yeah. you shouldn't be using intelligence sources. You shouldn't be able to. It shouldn't be constitutional. It shouldn't be legal to use intelligence sources no, to bring those kinds of cases. No, it's a violation of Fourth Amendment rights. But, you know, it, it brings up so many issues. And one of the biggest ones is it doesn't necessarily keep us safe. It give us, gives us a false sense of security when you've got so much information and you've got to go through it. You're going to miss people like we did in Orlando and San Bernardino. And uh, the, the most recent issues we've had of domestic terrorism. There's an enormous information disparity, unfortunately, between the people that have access to this and the rest of the general public. And they have real reasons for fighting some of that transparency and disclosure and also reasons of self-interest and, and, and lack of transparency for yeah. doing so. So it's really hard because we're always discussing this without having full access to the programs, of course. People yeah. don't know the full extent of it. I do think it's interesting the Obama administration does this. By in, executive order. By executive order in the last days before Donald Trump Why did they takes do that? office. I think because they're trying to just create more... Uh, sort of hurdles, things that the administration is going to have to deal with. The wet foot, dry foot policy for Cuban immigrants, for example. Yeah. There's Donald Trump going to now go back and say, okay, for this one class of immigrants, we're going to have this totally separate policy while we're building a wall and doing all the other things we promised we're going to do. Um, by The Obama administration has been bad, by the way, on national security issues yeah. that deal with the Fourth Amendment, that deal with uh, reasonable search and seizure. Of course, that's this why is, none of this is a surprise that he's increasing the surveillance. But why state. now? You have to ask why now? Uh, why not leave it for the next administration. A little, little last power grab, a little last middle so finger. It's like the last time I'm going to get to freedom. say this. I blame Obama. I blame Obama because I think that it, it, he does not fundamentally respect freedom. Buck Sexton does, say though. Myself. And that's why he's yes, coming he back Thank every you. time. Thank <laughs> you, my friend. Red tie. Always. Perfect. Coming up, will the White House press corps agree to form a family band with President Trump once he's in the White House and playing Irish drinking tunes? Find out on the next Topical Storm. All right, it's Monday, sunshine. Grab your harpsichord. Rick's got the banjo. We're getting the band back together, and we're starting here with this. This is the topical storm. Topic number one. This one comes to us from hashtag topical storm user Michael Lozer. You know you've asked yourself, what have Donald Trump's manual gesticulations been missing? An accordion, obviously. When you add the world's most painful instrument to his wild hand gestures, suddenly his presidency makes perfect sense. Here it is. I don't like the way that looks, but I would be able to do that if I wanted to. I'd be the only one that would be able to do that if we wanted to. I just don't want to because I think that would be a conflict. We're doing them a tremendous service by doing it. We are going to build a wall, and people will go crazy. <laughs> It's the music, the music that accompanies it. He's our Judy Tenuta. Take that, John Lewis. Topic number two. We now know who the world's greatest traveler is. His name is Sam Barsky, and he's also the world's greatest knitter. Every time Barsky visits a new landmark, he knits a sweater of it before he goes. And so far, he's created 103 different sweaters, from the Golden Gate Bridge, as you see there, to Stonehenge. Although my favorite is Sam Barsky, next to some power lines. Ooh. Now, here's the crazy thing. I have the exact same hobby. See, this is Tom Shalou's house. This is Tom Shalou's refrigerator. I like to snack on stuff. I find it sometimes when I sneak into his kitchen around 3 in the morning. This is Tom Shalou in bed. I had to watch her maybe 60 or 70 times before I got the sweater right. Sleeps like an angel. He smells like a wet dog. Topic number three. It's Martin Luther King Day when Americans honor Dr. King's legacy by going to the mountain. Because nothing ends racism like spending $200 per person in fresh white powdery snow. 
Here's one guy who found the perfect jump to show off his great ski skills. Just listen to the sound he makes right before he lands. <laughs> that double shriek is the sound one makes right before involuntary timber castration. There it is. <laughs> he sounds like a mockingbird. Inally gave birth to a cuckoo. I have a dream that one day I will be able to get all of the splinters out of my taint. Topic number four. In trying times like these, the world needs a hero. There may be a meatball sub or something along those lines. But when the sandwich is done, it's time for a superhero. And not just one, we need a whole team of them. It's Muerfin time. Looking good, everybody. All right, cool. Well, listen, I'm gonna take a quick cat nap. Wait, what? No! Oh, yeah, bro. Like, I had two chalupas for lunch, so I'm gonna need to sleep at least one of those bad boys off. There's no time for that. Ten minutes. Tops. Let's just go. Those aren't heroes. Those are cats. They are evil in disguise. If they try to save you, don't be fooled. It's a trap, and you will end up chained to a scratching post in a litter box being swatted like a ball of yarn. You'll then need the real Power Rangers to come save you. Oh, hey guys, so I just went and got the mail. So, bell time. Sweet. Oh, yeah? Cool. It's pretty great. Topic number five. A young man with way, way too much time on his hands has counted to 100,000 on YouTube. Because it takes 24 hours to listen to the whole video, we're only going to play it up till 12,450. So take a deep breath. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A lot of people are making fun of this guy. I, for one, applaud him because anything is better than that lurid Sesame Street video about counting. I could forever until I drop one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, I love f***ing will ever be a mom. I hope the children are out of the room right now. Thank you so much for watching. Please follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kennedy Nation. Use hashtag topical storm while you're there. On Facebook, it's Kennedy FBN. Email Kennedy FBN at foxbusiness.com. Tomorrow on the show, investigative journalist Glenn Greenwald, Tennessee Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn, and red eye maniac Andy Levy. Those are three hot tuna cans I want in my survival pantry. I'll see you tomorrow night. Goodbye.